All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on getting started with the J-Hipster Micronaut Blueprint. I'm Jen and I work with the 2GM team here at Object Computing. We're happy to have our guest presenter from J-Hipster. He's a developer board member, Frederick Hahn, with us today. Also presenting today will be Jason Schindler. Jason is a partner and principal software engineer here at Object Computing, and he's also the 2GM team manager. As a reminder, please load up your questions into the Q&A section as you have them. We'll be doing a live Q&A session at the end and answer as many questions as you have as time allows. We are recording this session and we'll plan to make it available to view on demand. I think that's it for me, guys. I know you have a lot to cover and are eager to get started, so I will pass it over to you. Thank you, Jen. Welcome, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, as Jen said, my name is Jason Schindler. I am a uh, 2GM ma team manager here at OCI, and I'm also a partner, and I'm here with uh, the incredible uh, Frederick Hahn. Uh, and today we're going to talk about getting started with the J Hipster Micronaut Blueprint. So we're going to do a few things. We'll uh, give you an introduction to J Hipster, uh, an introduction to Micronaut, uh, what blueprints are within J Hipster, and how they enable uh, extending the, the core functionality of J Hipster. And we'll also do a couple demos for you um, on uh, how to get started <laughs> with different kinds of application with jhipster and micronaut so uh, uh, first off uh, 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 a little bit of a celebration we just had the 1.0 release of mhipster which is the informal name of the micronaut blueprint for jhipster uh, this was a lot of uh, work and a lot of collaboration between uh, uh, the great folks in the jhipster community uh, the micronaut foundation and then object computing uh, we've uh, we've got a, a number of features that we'll we'll share with you here through the rest of the presentation. Um, uh, but uh, I'm I'm really happy about this release, and I'm I'm really proud to have been a part of it. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Frederick here, and he's going to give you a little introduction on J Hipster. Yes, thanks for the nice introduction. So welcome everybody. Um, so what is J Hipster? You may ask. Um, what we say from ourselves is we are a development platform to quickly generate, develop, and deploy modern web applications and microservice architectures. What we try to um, generate for you is a high-performance server-side stack, um, also with excellent test coverage and um, sonar score, for example. So we are having an eye on that. You will get a mobile-first UI, either with Angular, React, or Vue.js and Bootstrap as a CSS framework. So you can um, start right away with your application and some simple um, CRUD services. Uh, furthermore, you will have a nice uh, workflow to build your applications with Webpack, Maven, or Gradle. And um, when it comes to cloud deployments, we will generate you some infrastructure as code files. So um, you can choose, for example, between Heroku or um, Kubernetes, and we will generate all the required configurations for you. So you can start right away. Um, the next slide. Yes, so some, some numbers, maybe that's also interesting because I like these numbers a lot. So we have around 80,000 stars, more than 600 contributors on the main generator. And on our start.jhipster.tech um, tool, we have 50,000 registered users and more than 40,000 weekly downloads from NPM. And we have uh, since I think four weeks, um, 100,000 US dollars annual budget from uh, our sponsors. We are completely open source. So everything is developed in the open in GitHub. And maybe that's a fun fact. You may think J stands for Java, but that's not the case really. Um, we are on the main generator. It's 50% JavaScript, 20% TypeScript, and just 80% Java in the repository. But that's extensional. So um, some details. As I said, we will generate web applications for you. Um, it started in 2013 as a very simple bootstrapping generator to generate Spring View Boot and Angular JS applications. So maybe a slightly enhanced start.spring.io. Um, but today we are creating production-ready applications with data entities, unit integration tests, end-to-end -end tests, um, deployment configurations, and CI/CD configurations. 
Um, we are, of course, extensible. Um, that's how this um, Micronaut collaboration um, started. So you can extend the generator via modules or blueprints. Um, details on that later. And we are supporting today a wide range of technologies from the JVM and the non-JVM ecosystem. So there is also a back-end um, um, implementation of jhipster using .NET or Node.js. And of course, different databases, SQL, NoSQL, different test frameworks. So um, we have test containers, if you like. And um, you can generate, for example, Gatling tests to um, yeah, make performance tests of your application. And yes, extending the hipster, that's what we will see today mostly. So um, when it started, um, there were always some limited capabilities to extend your hipster. So there was a small API in the generator and you could um, write a so-called module where you can add, for example, um, dependencies to, to the build file. You could generate some new files, very limited. And so you can, for example, bring a new um, front end dependency to the project and show, for example, a map in the front end or um, generate ASCII doc documentation for your API with Gradle or Maven, but that's very small changes. So you couldn't change the whole thing. Um, meaning larger changes would have required changes or changes to the jhipster core, um, which is of course hard to maintain because usually someone wants a feature, implements it and the maintenance burden comes to the core maintainers. So that's something we didn't want to anymore. So that's how the blueprints um, came up. And blueprints are basically, yeah, um, under the hood, we are using Yeoman, a JavaScript tool to, yeah, to generate files, basically. And um, these generators can be composed. So jhipster itself uses um, sub-generators, which are again blueprints. So a new blueprint then can just compose with the main uh, with, or with the core blueprint. So meaning if we have a, um, the server side generator, for example, um, a blueprint can compose with that and override maybe everything or just a small set of files. Um, and basically you can do what you want. Um, there are no limits, basically. But you can use the configurations, uh, configuration options and the whole framework jhipster provides, but you can create a totally different application. So different set of files, different set of configurations. As I said, um, the um, Node.js backend has nearly nothing to do with what we generate for Spring Boot or Micronaut. Um, and what is also interesting is that can blue, blueprints can be combined. Um, so if there is a blueprint for Micronaut and Vue.js, um, you can combine them very easily because they are mutually exclusive somehow. If you think of um, Micronaut and the Quarkus blueprint, yeah, you could do that, but it doesn't make much sense because at the end you will have a strange <laughs> application, right? So um, there are are basically no limits, but some doesn't make sense. Jason, your turn. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, I, I wanna just spend a little bit and talk about uh, Micronaut for the uninitiated. So uh, I said earlier, I'm the 2GM team manager here at Object Computing and 2GM is short for uh, Groovy, Grails and Micronaut. So Micronaut is a modern, uh, open source JVM based full stack framework. It was developed here at Object Computing uh, by the team that uh, developed Grails. So a lot of our uh, experience and our lessons uh, in the Grails frame framework came uh, straight in to, uh, to Micronaut. Um, and uh, what it provides is uh, a, a, a framework uh, infrastructure, I'll call it, or architecture that you're likely familiar with if you've worked with other uh, JVM-based frameworks before uh, with some huge benefits like uh, much faster startup time, uh, much higher throughput, 
uh, much lower uh, memory footprints, and uh, and we really put a focus early on on uh, integrations with major cloud providers. So we have uh, uh, supported first class integration with uh, Google GCP. Um, uh, Azure, AWS, uh, Oracle Cloud. Uh, so if you are de deploying to a cloud environment, and you probably are, uh, Micronaut is an excellent choice. Um, now, these memory improvements, the startup time improvements, how do we do that? So uh, in traditional JVM application frameworks, uh, when you're doing uh, dependency injection, uh, or, uh, or aspect-oriented programming, uh, the framework is making decisions at runtime, right, uh, to decide which instance of a particular uh, interface or, or class that it needs to inject in order for something to run. Uh, and that takes, uh, well, first off, it, it uses something called reflection, right, where it's basically uh, looking at the class path, looking at the classes that are there, looking at the metadata about those things, and then making decisions about them. So to do that, it has to load a bunch of that into memory, uh, take CPU time to go through it, right? Uh, and um, uh, so th that makes your memory footprint uh, bigger, and it makes your startup time uh, slower, uh, because all that work needs to be done then. And really, uh, we found with Micronaut that many of those decisions can be made or at least optimized for right at build time. So uh, a lot of the things that you would be doing in reflection in a traditional JVM framework, uh, and what I'm talking about is like you know, spring, right? Uh, you can really figure out a lot of the answers that you need right at build time, uh, create the code that needs to be created so that when the application goes to run, uh, the decisions have been made. We don't have to load everything into memory. Uh, we don't have to uh, figure out which which bean to um, uh, inject, or if we do, we've at least got kind of a, a shortcut straight to that. Right. So, uh, it's a smooth learning curve here on the second bullet, and that's really that really is the case. So, if you've worked with any of these JVM frameworks before, and I suspect that you have, uh, you're going to feel pretty at home in Micronaut. There's a lot of uh, similarities. We use um, uh, standard annotations uh, for things like injection, uh, uh, JPA for entity management. So, a lot of the annotations that you know, a lot of the uh, structure you know, is already in place. Um, we have support for. Uh, 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 Maven and Gradle builds, so you've, you're, you're likely used to that. Um, because of the fast startup time, uh, you can actually spin up complete server instances and clients in your unit tests and run them instantaneously. So there's, uh, you're able to do more with your testing uh, and get uh, a little, a little zoomed out where you can do more integration style tests uh, of your entire stack without having to worry about. Uh, the runtime costs of doing that. Uh, we have support for Java, Groovy, and Kotlin. Uh, if you recall, Groovy is one of the G's in 2GM. Uh, Scala is on the roadmap. We recently had some great work uh, uh, done on the Scala side, so we're, we've been advancing that here. Um, but uh, uh, if you are a Java, Groovy, or Kotlin programmer, you can use Micronaut uh, today. Uh, with those languages. Uh, we support any framework that implements reactive streams. This would include Rx, Java, and Reactor, and we're native image compatible. And I'm gonna spend just a moment talking about that. So we have an excellent relationship with the Growl VM team. Uh, we have a, uh, a joint CI. So we have a number of test applications uh, that just have various um, uh, features uh, uh, integrated together where when there's a change in the Micronaut code base or the uh, GraalVM code base, we run through those test applications and, and look for issues. We are almost always compatible with the latest GraalVM. Uh, we find a number of issues with GraalVM uh, but many times before they know it. So it seems like uh, you know every other week or so, we've, we've got something that we identified and then we work with the GraalVM team, figure out uh, what side of the house it's on, uh, uh, a fix gets applied and uh, the open source community wins. And uh, again, just a, another point on the, uh, the cloud integration. So uh, Micronaut has a lot of focus uh, right from the beginning on uh, first class integration with major, major cloud providers. So if you're deploying to um, a GCP, for instance, or AWS, Oracle Cloud, Micronaut Azure, um, 
uh, you can use the integrations that we've built or in, in some case, the, the community built. Um, so like for just an example, uh, Google Cloud came in, that was a uh, an initial contribution for someone at GCP. And, uh, and start running with Micronaut right away in your cloud of choice. All right, so let's talk about mHipster a little bit. So as I said, mHipster is kind of the informal name of the uh, Micronaut blueprint for jhipster. Uh, we'll, we'll see these uh, these features here in a moment when I demo the CLI, uh, but you can generate monolith or microservice applications. Uh, we support both uh, JWT or OAuth 2 uh, for auth, um, uh, Gradle and Maven build systems, uh, SQL databases, so uh, uh, MySQL, Maria, Postgres, and then H2 for development purposes, multiple caching implementations uh, like EH Cache, Caffeine, and Redis, uh, for a, a front-end application, you can opt for uh, Angular or React. Uh, you can also just opt not to have a client at all. Uh, we have support for protractor tests and uh, and Heroku deployment, which um, uh, Frederick will be talking. Or uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Frederick will be talking about in just a little bit. So, if you want to get started, uh, the best way to do that is to use npm to install uh, the jhipster generator. So this is. This is the parent generator, and then the uh, the Micronaut generator. So that's the install dash g, and uh, create a new folder for your project, and then run the mhipster command. And I have done that over here. So I went ahead and got it started. Zoom uh, wreaks havoc on uh, my CPU, and it makes things take a long time to start. So I uh, I went ahead and just preloaded this. Um, so if you run that mhipster command, uh, this is what you will be uh, 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 presented with. And down here, you get your first choice of a monolith or a microservice application. So for the point of uh, the, this demo, we're gonna go through monoliths. And uh, Jen or, or Frederick, if you, you know, if there's any font or sizing issues or anything, just let me know, feel free to pipe up because I won't, I won't know. Right. And we'll give it a name. So I'm just gonna say hello, and hipster. Right. Uh, default package name, uh, you can see it, it picked hello and hipster for me, and I think that's just fine. Uh, which type of authentication? So again, we have JWT and uh, uh, OAuth here, so we're going to pick JWT. Uh, what type of database? So right now, our uh, database support is all SQL, so I'm just going to pick that. And then uh, which production database you would like to use? So you'll notice H2 is not on this list. I'll go ahead and pick MySQL. And then which development database you would like to use. So you could, you can, if you like, uh, pick MySQL for development as well. Um, I actually, I think that's a good idea to do. You'd you know, be using uh, uh, test containers locally and um, uh, and a Docker image in order to run things in development. Uh, but for for speed and convenience, we're going to go with H2 in memory here. Uh, do we want to use a cache? Sure. Yeah, let's use a uh, caffeine cache. Do we want to enable, enable hibernate second level cache? Sure. That sounds good. Uh, what build tool? So again, we have Maven and Gradle support. I'm going to pick Gradle. Uh, the client. So you can, you can pick no client. You don't have to have a client, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick React. And then it has uh, options for all the uh, the boot swatch themes. So if you've been if you've done this is these are basically uh, uh, themes that lay over um, uh, Bootstrap. If you've done UI development before, so I'm going to pick Cyborg and I'll use the primary nav bar. Uh, would you like to enable naturalization? Sure. We'll say uh, English as a primary language and pick. Uh, we'll do Spanish. There it is. As another language. Uh, and then do we want to use other test frameworks besides JUnit and Jess? So we have the option to select Protractor here. All right, and then go ahead and get started. So right now what it's doing is it's uh, uh, applying a, a template and generating all those files for you. And it's going to start doing an NPM install and I'm going to stop it because that it takes a long time. I've got a, uh, I've got a, a pre-baked uh, version of this that, that we can go look at in a moment. So right now you have uh, a full application. Uh, it's got the name and the packages uh, that you've picked. It has the features enabled that you picked uh, because we said JWT, it's got a lot of uh, services for user management and that sort of thing in there now. Uh, but we're, it's, it's not all that interesting because we don't have any entities. So we're gonna create a couple of entities. 
And we can do that with the mhipster entity command. And I've been doing this example where I have uh, schools of fish. So I'll create the fish entity. And hopefully this doesn't take too long. Nope, not too bad. Uh, do we want to add a field? Sure. So let's give the fish a name and we'll make that a string. We'll, we'll add some validation rules. We'll say that name is required and we'll give it a minimum length. Uh, and the minimum we'll say three. Uh, let's also give the fish a uh, age. Make that an int. Uh, we'll also make that required. And a minimum, we'll say that you can't have a negatively aged fish. That seems to make sense to me. Uh, and let's do one more. So um, something a little bit more interesting, say water type. So it's freshwater fish, saltwater fish. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll name it that. And if you go down a bit here, uh, you'll see that one of the options for type is uh, an enum. So we'll give that a name of water type. And then we can give it what the options are. So we'll just say uh, fresh and salt. Okay. Uh, and let's go ahead and make that required. Okay. No more fields. Um, it's also going to prompt us here if we want to add relationships to other entities. We don't have any other entities right now, so I'm going to go ahead and say no. Uh, we'll we'll shore that up in just a second. Um, now, so this is this is interesting. So now that we have an entity, we're going to create a REST endpoint for that entity and a repository, right, to handle the the JPA calls uh, through Hibernate to to persist information for the entity. We're also going to have the option here to create a service class. So basically, instead of the REST controller getting the uh, an instance of the repository, we can wrap it with a service class for business logic, which is a good idea. And we can also say, let's do a service uh, interface and do an implementation. And for this one, let's pick that. Um, we get the option to use a DTO if we like. Uh, I'll just use the entity directly. Is it read only? No. Uh, and then uh, what sort of pagination do we want? We, uh, we'll just skip pagination for now. Okay, now it's going through again and it's generating uh, the files that we need for it. So you'll notice some things here. There's uh, uh, the entity class itself, the repository. Uh, this is the controller, uh, this fish resource here. And then we're getting a conflict because the liquid base migration uh, has already been written and uh, so if we, we just type the letter A here and overwrite it, um, and, and that's fine. This failure that just came up, that's because I stopped the NPM install uh, before, so it's, it's not a big deal. We'll just go ahead and add a second entity for school so we can build a relationship between the two. All right, uh, so school, we should at least have a name. I think we'll make it a string and a... Uh, We'll just make it required, I think. It wouldn't be good to have a school without a name. Uh, and that's, that's probably good for fields. So let's build a relationship. So what we want to do is create a relationship back to fish. So one fish has, has many school, or I'm sorry, one school has many fish. So the name of the other entity is fish. Uh, we're going to name the relationship fish. This is like what the, what the variable's called in this entity. Um, let's see, so this is a one to many, one school has many fish, was the name of the relationship on the other side, school, uh, and that should be good. Okay, and for here, I think last time we did the interface and implementation, let's just say uh, service class, and I think that's all fine. All right, we get a conflict again, and that's okay. Great. Now we're going to go back into FISH really quick and just uh, put the uh, relationship between FISH and school as well. All right. So when we go back into an entity that's already been created, we're going to get an option up here where we say, uh, it says, do you want to re regenerate the entity? Basically start over. Do you want to add more fields and relationships? Do you want to remove something that's already there? Or, um, or do you just want to exit? Let's go ahead and add uh, more fields and relationships. I don't think we need to add any fields to the entity, but we do want to add a relationship. We want to add it back to school, right? So school, 
school is fine. Uh, and then this one's going to be a mini to one. So when this is this this is a great question. When it's displayed, what field do we want to show, right? And it, it defaults to ID, which kind of makes sense. But we're going to go ahead and pick name. Uh, uh, I don't think we need validation rules here, and I don't think we need any other relationships. So I'll write the conflict, and there we go. All right. And again, this failure is just because we uh, we stopped the npm install from happening early on. So now I'm going to go over to my uh, my my fully baked so you know in the uh, cooking shows they they take the raw casserole and put it in one oven and take the cooked casserole and pull it out of the other one that's what we're doing here uh, but I, I just want to show you around a little bit what what we got with this project so uh, you'll see uh, docker images so these are um, these are Docker Compose uh, configurations. You've got one for uh, MySQL here because that's the, the database that we picked. Uh, the application would, of course, tie all those things together. Uh, we've got, and I'm, I'm not going to go through everything. There's a bunch here. Uh, let's do the web app next. So here's our React application. If I go into the app, uh, let's do something more interesting than that. So here is the uh, fish component. Um, uh, you'll see it's in uh, TypeScript. That's available to us. Um, and I think uh, Frederick mentioned earlier that this is using uh, Webpack. Uh, in the Java application, here's our, our main application. We can look at, uh, so let's look at the, um, the fish REST endpoint. So uh, this was all uh, generated by our application. Uh, we're taking in a fish service here. Uh, here's a, the post method to create a new fish. Um, uh, it takes an a fish on the body, uh, does a save, uh, and then uh, returns the result. We've got um, uh, updating a fish with the put operation. Basically, the things you would expect, uh, retrieving uh, all of the fish, uh, retrieving a specific fish by ID, and deleting a fish. So you can, of course, go in here and um, add to this, remove from it uh, uh, if you need to do so. Uh, let's take a look at the, here I'll go through the this view so you can see a little bit more. So if you go into the services, you'll see uh, fish service here is an interface. And then in impl, there's the implementation for it. Um, and then in repository, you'll see here's our Micronaut Data uh, Fish repository that's just extending JPA repository. So if you needed to add more uh, uh, queries, here, uh, you could do it. You could do it here, um, and if necessary, turn it into an abstract class. And the last thing I want to point out is the Liquibase migration. Oh well, here real quick while we're here. Uh, you'll see that we've generated configuration files for, um, uh, you have your base configuration here in application, and then also uh, the dev and the prod environments. You can, of course, customize any of this and add more if you need to. So in config, we have liquid base migrations. Uh, it has um, uh, data for uh, fish in school. This is fake data that it just, it just generated for us. Uh, when we load this in uh, development mode, it'll by default uh, preload this into the database. You can disable that. Um, and then the creation of the initial schema and then the structures needed for uh, managing these entities. So that's all pretty cool. You get all of that right out of the box, just typing the command and making the menu choices that I picked there earlier. So I believe I've got a running instance of this that I'll show you really quick. Yeah, so let's pull up, uh, stop presenting here for a second. All right, so here's the UI. It's just on localhost 8080. Um, you see Harper here. That's how you know that you've, uh, you've, you've reached a good point. Uh, one thing to point out here, if you recall, we picked some internationalization options between English and Spanish. I can um, I can flip those there. Uh, we have most translations. Uh, not everything's in there. Some things you have to you have to put in yourself. I can go ahead and sign in, and I'm just going to use the admin account here. All right, I'm logged in now, 
every password manager in the world wants to manage that for me, okay? And uh, let's, first, let's look through the administration a little bit. So of course, again, this is all out of the box. Um, uh, because we're doing a JVT, JWT auth, we have a user management built into our application. I can come over here and deactivate or reactivate a, uh, a user. I can uh, change their roles, uh, add new ones. If we want to look at metrics real quick, here's uh, just some JVM metrics. We have uh, memory threads system, uh, garbage collection information uh, requests. Uh, uh, different endpoints and the, they're popular. So this is uh, obviously part of the uh, the client application here. So this is all good stuff. And uh, yeah, other so health checks, uh, uh, configuration items. Um, and this is all available to me because I'm the admin user, by the way. If I logged in as not an admin, I wouldn't see all of this. All right, and then we have pages for our different entities. So here's the fish page. This is that fake data that I showed you a little bit ago. Uh, and then here's our school. So let's go ahead and just create a school really quick. And I named it this once and now I can't not name it the cool school for fresh fish. So now we have a new uh, school down here called Cool School for Fresh Fish. We can obviously delete some of these other options if we wanted. Uh, we could edit them, et cetera. So if we go back to fish and we create a new fish and we'll call it, uh, I don't know, uh, Frankie the Fish, uh, who is one. Uh, here's our enum options, if you recall. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and pick fresh because it's the cool school for fresh fish. Uh, we don't want them to feel out of place and save that. <clears throat> and there's our new fish and you'll see you have a link here to uh, back to your school. So these these screens aren't, aren't all that interesting, right? Uh, likely when you start developing your application, you'll need to do something else here, but it gives you all the wiring, the routes, the, the, the starting point, the templates to manage these different entities, uh, 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 save them, change them, delete them, and do all of that. I think I can go back to presenting now. And I'm just going to fast forward. I had a bunch of stuff just in case it didn't work out. And I'm going to pass it over to uh, Frederick, who's going to show you uh, the um, microservice application type. Yes, thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Makes sense. Um, come on, Google. Reload. Don't know. So again, ah, no, it works. Okay, so we've seen um, this CLI with a monolithic application. Now let's have a look at um, a microservice application. Um, what you see here is the, um, maybe it's slightly outdated um, architecture where how jhipster generates microservice applications. So you see here, there is a configuration service, maybe console or Eureka under the hood. We have some um, access control server, maybe Keycloak or Okta or what you like. And we have a gateway application which um, hosts the front end and then um, proxies the request to the microservices. Um, so we will have a look at the gateway and the microservice. Um, you should note the gateway is still um, a standard jhipster application, as you will see in a minute. Um, if you recall the CLI Jason showed, um, you could only select um, monolithic or microservice application. So we will now generate some kind of this picture here with two microservices, which are implemented with Micronaut and the gateway comes from the original Spring Boot jhipster. How we will do that? So we will basically generate something like that. Um, you have here a gateway service, which is generated using OAuth with a Postgres database Angular and you have two microservices. Um, one is a yeah, CRM-like microservice which holds customers and their orders and some products. And you have a 
um, second microservice which holds the invoices. Um, now let's think of that a moment. You have one, two, three, four, five, six entities at least, and a lot of um, relations between them. Personally, I don't want to do that with the CLI um, because it's much too complicated and too error prone. So JHipster has something for that. Um, basically, it's the JHipster domain language. Maybe you've heard of that. Um, so this picture, how is it generated? I didn't draw it myself. Um, it's an online tool we have, and you can then describe your whole applications and entities with um, a textual based domain language. So um, is it okay to read um, or too small, by the way? It's a little small, but I can read it. If you could zoom in once, I think that, yes. yeah, that's what much yeah, better. Looks good. Okay, perfect. So you see here um, the application keyword and then the configuration. So now you can say, I want to have a base name, which kind of application you want to have, the package name. So basically all you have seen um, before uh, in the CLI. And the nice thing is you have even code completion here, right? Um, so it will give you a hint what is supported or not. Um, so now you do, can do that for multiple applications and multiple entities. Um, you have here our gateway application saying it holds basically all entities because that's where the uh, front end is generated. And then you see here our two microservice applications. Um, the important part here is then now to define the blueprints. Um, this application should use. In this case, it's just a Micronaut Blueprint. And you can see different configurations. So you need a different port, of course, to start it locally. We are using console for service discovery and are using OAUS. Um, and we are skipping the user management part um, because it's just a microservice. It has no UI and it's using um, key cloak for the whole user management. And this one, the CRM as seen here um, holds all entities except invoice and shipment. So entity star and yeah, the other one in the invoice service. What's the cool thing about uh, the JDR studio, if you do that and you should see it in a minute, I hope. Usually it should update the image. Uh, didn't work. Why? Maybe. Yeah, but that worked. So you see it's updating in real time. You will have a nice um, picture here. Um, what you see in addition is the whole validations are also described in a textual way. So this one is required. Here is a um, minimal um, validation. You can even do regex pattern validation. So basically everything you could do with the, um, with the CLI, you can do in a textual way. And then when it comes to relationships, uh, you can then describe them too, of course, um, from the owning entity to the uh, related entity and so on. So it's quite long. And what is now important for the microservice part is uh, you need to define um, where the uh, entities basically live in the end. So you say this is a microservice and where to find them in which microservice. And in the end, you can even define uh, the deployment you want to have. In this case, we're using Docker Compose. We need to define where the um, applications are stored in the end. So um, you will see that in a minute. Um, but of course, you could also say, I don't want to have Docker Compose. I want to have um, Kubernetes and then um, define different properties for the Kubernetes part. Um, so let's have a look. Um, you see, this is just the, um, this folder here with this JDL file. Um, and of course, if you use a VS Code, you will have 
also nice code completion when you install the um, add-on we have. That's pretty nice. So what you do now, um, basically you're also using a CLI, but this time make sure to use jhipster, not mhipster, because otherwise it will try to generate the gateway also with um, Micronaut and that's not supported right now. So what you do now is just, ah, wrong folder, this one. So you see there is the JDL file and you can just import the JDL. And now it will generate all three applications at once. Oh yeah, Zoom is very resource consuming, but you've seen uh, the jhipster logo and the mhipster logo. So it worked basically as expected, it's generating the gateway with jhipster and then uses mhipster to generate the two microservices. Um, and as Jason said, I have of course prepared that already. Um, so here is the um, store front end. We can have a look. And the store as we defined is um, a Gradle project. And just to make sure there should be some spring inside. Yes, that's our spring application, spring boot application generated with jhipster. And if we look at, um, for example, the invoice service, this one is then the Micronaut um, application as we've seen before. So what you can do now, I've started already um, Keycloak. So jhipster brings um, a ready to use Keycloak, Docker configuration and uh, a console configuration as we have defined console for service discovery. What you can do now, you can just start the gateway application And the two microservices, I hope that works with Zoom running in the background. It should not take too much time because I didn't change anything. I hope. So if we look, for example, at the invoice service, you will see everything Jason um, showed already. So there is the web um, folder, which is holding the invoice resource. Um, you will see the invoice repository for that, the invoice service and all the stuff we've seen before. There is the build configuration. What you don't see here, of course, is the um, package JSON and the a webpack configuration because the front end is not generated inside the microservice. It's generated on the gateway. So, and everything is running, I guess. So we can open the application and you see it's more or less similar to what we've seen. Um, the main difference is of course the, um, the mascot here. Um, it's not a hopper because it's not a micro application but you can now log in and different. Um, now you're forwarded to Keycloak, but you can use the same uh, credentials. So by default, it's admin admin. You see we are an admin now and we see the same screens just generated with um, Angular and jhipster. So you see here are our two services, the CRM and the invoice service. They are discovered via console. You see here the metrics, so same screen, basically, um, different application. And here you see now the um, different entities we have. So the product, and of course you can create them. Um, T-shirt, it's 10 and it's NL, so you can save it. And the main difference is this is now um, saved in our 
um, store microservice. So what you can do too, what we didn't see before um, are the testing capabilities. So uh, Jason mentioned we are supporting protractor tests. So you can run them pretty easy and you will see everything should work. Yes, so that's what um, JHipster brings out of box. And of course you can build on that and test your own um, screens if you have one. Um, everything is already set up for you. You don't have to do that on your own. Okay, so it takes some time, of course, but it's still pretty quick. Yes, let's run it in the background. Okay, so we have seen how easy it is to set up a microservice um, architecture. Um, yeah, that's just for reference. So you see here the um, gateway application again and the um, microservice application in detail. And basically you can do it with four commands. Um, you can import it, start the pre-baked Docker Compose configurations and then start the applications in development mode. Or you can um, do a Docker build for all projects and in the root folder, um, you can just start the whole, um, um, the whole um, architecture. So this one will start console for your key cloak and all three applications with Docker Compose. Um, you could use that also to deploy to your um, cloud provider if you like. So let's have a look at the test, yes. 32 tests passing in under one minute. I'm expected worse. So let's stop that again. Okay, so um, one thing, maybe I can show one more thing because Jason said I will do so, but it was not planned. Um, so deploying to Heroku. You're um, welcome. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that, that's always something I like to present because that's so cool. Um, I've created um, a monolithic application here just right now while Jason was talking. And now we can deploy to Heroku. Um, I didn't try it on this machine, so I hope it works. Um, so we need to uh, choose a name and we will deploy it in the EU because I'm here and we will compile on Heroku using Java 11. And now it's setting up the application. Yes, override everything. Setting up the application on Heroku, provisioning the um, required add-on. So in this case, just a Postgres database add-on, if you would choose um, OAuth, it will prompt you to uh, choose if you like to want to use Okta, the Okta Heroku add-on, and it will provision that for you. Um, so you can start right away. So this takes some time. In the meantime, let's have a look at what's coming next for the Micronaut Blueprint. So the most um, important issue is the upgrade to JHIPSA 7. If you followed um, JHipster, JHipster 7 was released in, I think in March or February, not sure. Um, there are some breaking changes, um, but I hope they are not too heavy for us so we can update to JHipster 7 um, as base, which will um, give us some new dependencies, uh, new versions for Gradle, for example, and other things out of box. Um, Micronaut as a gateway application would be fine and supporting reactive applications. So in JHipster 6, reactive 
support was still in um, experimental state. Now it's yeah basically available to everyone. And of course, it would be super cool to have the Micronaut Blueprint support that. Um, the Micronaut Blueprint does not support native images yet. Um, there is a pending um, pull request for that. Um, there are some little bugs left. Um, so I hope we can um, bring that to you in the near future. And, and of course, um, as always, fixing existing bugs and streamline the user experience and update the documentation. Um, so where to find the blueprint, for example, and how to handle it. And what's the differences between um, a standard JHipster application and the Micronaut applications. If you like contributing, um, you're welcome. You can help us reporting or validating issues, um, requesting features, of course. We are happy to implement new things, uh, fixing documentation, fixing bugs, um, the usual stuff, or even implementing complete features or enhancements. So, for example, the, um, the um, GraalVM support ca comes from a community member. Um, so that's pretty cool. And if you like to start, have a look at our GitHub page. Make sure to read our contribution guidelines and the code of conduct. And of course, um, look out for bug bounties. Um, if you fix a bug that's labeled like this, um, you're happy because you can get $100 from the JHipster Open Collective. Um, pretty nice. And if you like to sponsor it, um, you can do it with the Open Collective of JHipster or maybe become a member of the JHipster Association. It's a French nonprofit organization um, owning the copyright of the JHipster source code. And at the moment, the JHipster Association is creating a tech advisory board to ensure the advancement of JHipster. And at the moment, um, it's 16 members already from six countries. And it organizes the annual JHipster conference or JHipster developer meetup, depending on what's possible this year. Um, and of course, there's the Micronaut Foundation. Um, Jason will tell us a bit more. Yeah, thank you. So um, the Micronaut Foundation is a not-for-profit uh, organization that exists to uh, support and, and lead the open source uh, Micronaut project. Um, uh, we uh, we we have a techno technology advisory board as well. Uh, we want to make sure that um, we are uh, uh, building the features going in the direction that the that the broader community uh, needs us to go in. Um, where you, it, it exists to ensure the technical innovation and advancement of the Micronaut framework as a free and open source public uh, use software development framework. Uh, to evangelize and promote uh, Micronaut, so uh, some of what we're doing right here today, and to uh, build and support an ecosystem of complementary documentation, functionality, and services. So um, if you use Micronaut or if your organization uses Micronaut, we're certainly interested in uh, uh, getting to know you a little bit better and, and how you use it. And um, if, you're, uh, if you're benefiting from Micronaut and you want to become a, uh, a sponsor of the Micronaut Foundation, or if you want to... Uh, uh, to talk to your your company about about doing so. Um, uh, please go out to the Micronaut website. Uh, you can always just send us an email, and that's an excellent way to get started. We have different sponsorship levels. If you uh, if you uh, uh, do the VIP sponsorship, we'll send you a nice little bag of of goodies, which will uh, in include things like a. It won't be this T-shirt. It'll be uh, probably an even better T-shirt uh, that's specifically for the Micronaut Foundation. So please consider that. All right, uh, some community resources here. So uh, this will blend. We'll, we'll talk about this again in the Q A just Q and A just a little bit. But the uh, if if you're interested in M Hipster itself, uh, the best place to start is really the GitHub repository. That's where you'll find the most information, and you can uh, tap into uh, uh, the community there, including uh, Frederick and myself. Uh, the J Hipster website, the Micronaut website, of course. The 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 cool JDL Studio uh, the, that Frederick was showing. There's a link to it right there. Uh, the um, uh, J Hipster Open Collective uh, sponsorship link, the Micronaut Foundation, 
And uh, if you're working on, or if, if, if you have questions about Micronaut itself, um, uh, there's a lot of good resources for that. Uh, uh, one of which is we have a, a Getter channel uh, that has a pretty pretty active community. And so if you want to go there and, and talk to us and, and get to know us that way, please do. And if you uh, need some help with Micronaut, uh, Object Computing has uh, consulting options that you can find at that last page there. Okay, so I think that's a wrap. Yeah, so, yep. so can we go into Q&A? I think, yeah, we absolutely yes. can. So um, we had quite a few questions come into the Q&A. Jason, I think that you've queued up some of those that you're gonna go ahead and answer live. Yeah. Um, so if you wanna go ahead and, and do some of those. And then yeah. um, there were a couple that were um, over in the chat if you wanna, Glance over those, Frederick, um, and see if yes. any of those are some that you want to answer while yes, Jason's maybe. looking at Q and A, and then we Perfect. can we can go um, from there, and we'll get as many of those done as we can. Yes, right. thank you guys. And if anyone throw... needs to drop off, um, I know that it is the top of the hour, so if anyone does need to drop off, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. We do have a couple training events coming up. We have Micronaut with AWS coming up um, later on this month. And we also have a Groovy Data Science workshop coming up in June. So we hope to see you at our next few events coming up. And um, Jason, go ahead and we'll try to get as many of these questions uh, answered for everyone. I think I think Frederick's gonna show the Heroku deployment real quick yes. because- it, so, yeah. um, Okay, awesome. Uh, where's my console? So basically it took, it was quite fast. 20 seconds can't be. Um, so, but it's there, you've seen it here. So it's on Heroku um, and you can do everything you like. So if you log in as admin, um, you will see the administration screens and uh, it has no entities, just the default application I just generated. Um, but everything is here as you see, um, just with one command on Heroku for you available. Um, without doing anything, which is pretty nice, I think. So, um, Frederick, if, if, if we ever present yeah. together again, you can you can lob a, just a completely unexpected thing over the fence to me and say that, you know, and Jason's <laughs> gonna show you whatever and I'll, I'll, I'll have had it coming. I'm sorry for doing that, but, but you pulled it off and it looks great. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so uh, let me check, can I stop the share with the chat? Um, uh, so the first one here from Satish, how do I get started with Micronaut Framework? Um, let me, uh, I'll share my screen really quick. So there's a, uh, let's see, let me see if this is the right window. Yeah. So uh, if you want to generate a new application that's strictly Micronaut, so this isn't mHipster what we've shown today, this should just be a standalone Micronaut application. Uh, you can go to Micronaut Launch, uh, which is just launch.micronaut.io. Uh, we'll go ahead and add this to the slides before we send them out as a as another link. And uh, here you can choose the the application type, the the Java version. Uh, give some package details, uh, your build system, your test framework, etc. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff here. Uh, you can uh, preview the application, click through, and see uh, uh, what it would have created. Uh, for you. Uh, you can generate the project yourself and, and download it as a zip file. You can get the commands to, uh, to, to do it. So if you wanted to use curl to, uh, to grab this exact configuration that we just did here, there was the, there's the command that you could use to do that. Or if you'd like to use the Micronaut CLI, uh, which is available on SDK Man, uh, and you can also uh, download it from uh, Seats on Chocolatey and um, uh, for, for Windows folks and uh, uh, homebrew, I believe, and then you can also download uh, download it as a zip from our releases and use it that way. Uh, you can also push it straight to GitHub, right? So if you have a, a GitHub account, which I imagine you probably do, uh, you can do that. And there's all the features that are available in Micronaut. You can uh, pull up here. So like we showed uh, caffeine, so I can add the caffeine feature in. Uh, and then if I preview it, it has the caffeine stuff uh, included as well. Next question. Uh, oh, it, it scrolled on me. Uh, J Hipster Micronaut is the most spectacular 
blueprint. Well, thank you, Eduardo. Uh, but it doesn't support MongoDB, uh, any temporary solution. Yeah, and then you you link to the issue there. So uh, we have an issue to support it. Um, if you'd like to uh, to come in there and, and help out, that that would certainly be welcome. But uh, right now, you're you're correct. It does not support uh, MongoDB. Is Groovy now an option for Micronaut and GraalVM? So Groovy is not yet supported uh, for Micronaut and GraalVM. Uh, are micro front ends supported with JHipster, uh, like single SPA? Uh, Frederick, do you want to take that? Yes, um, basically not yet. Um, we have an open issue for that, um, discuss different um, approaches to that. Um, single SPA is one possible um, approach. Um, I think there is a yeah, proof of concept um, already for that. Um, but you should have a look at the at the uh, JHipster repository. There's a is an issue with an ongoing discussion and the status for that. Um, yeah. Uh, I have established. I have an established microservices based JHipster app using Eureka. I know that startup times for Micronaut are significantly better than Spring Boot. Apart from that, are there any reasons to migrate to mHipster? Uh, well, so let me uh, let me start off on this. And, and Frederick, I'm sure you have some th thoughts here too. But uh, uh, first off, if you have uh, microservices, you would be able to um, uh, to start mixing in some mHipster and Micronaut microservices there. So if you do want to experiment with it, uh, that's a great uh, that's that's a great way to get started. Um, and uh, and and as far as other reasons uh, to to use mHipster, so with mHipster you get Micronaut, and we think Micronaut's pretty great. Uh, so beyond the startup time, uh, there are some benefits as far as. Uh, uh, throughput and memory footprint. Um, uh, last year we did a comparisons and there's a, a source code repo for that uh, where we were we were just comparing the performance of uh, Spring Boot uh, versus Micronaut uh, at the time it was Micronaut 1 and Micronaut 2. And uh, we did those comparisons using an application generated by mHipster because we wanted to have something realistic, right? So we wanted to have actual entities in there uh, instead of just trying to create the simplest application we could as, as a way to illustrate throughput and startup time. So there's, um, uh, so we do have a, a, a code out there that's reviewable and, and available uh, of projects generated by mHipster and their Spring Boot equivalents in jHipster and the performance improvements that you get there. Do you have anything to add to that, Frederick? Um, no, basically, if you are happy with Spring Boot, you don't have to migrate. Um, what a benefit also could be, um, yeah, as Jason said, less memory footprint, but there is no need to, to migrate if it works well, right? Uh, if I select Keycloak Okta as my OAuth 2 for microservices, do you install Keycloak Okta dependencies or libraries? Uh, or use Spring uh, Security OAuth for Auth? Um, uh, so with the monolith, I know that we do have, uh, we, we provide Keycloak as a, um, a Docker Compose file for Keycloak, so you can start it up uh, locally for your, your development and the like. Um, Frederick, what happens with the microservices profile? Um, that's basically the same. So um, I think the question is tailored towards special libraries for Keycloak or Okta. No, we don't add them. So it's just all configuration. So it's just standard um, Spring Boot, um, OpenID Connect configurations, and same for, for Micronaut. When is mHipster expected to be released for jHipster 701? Hopefully, very soon. So that's that's as we shared in the um, in the next steps. That's uh, that's a big that's a big uh, priority for us right here. So uh, we're going to be focusing on that in the very near future. Uh, is there commercial support for Micronaut? Yes, there is. Let me share again, really quick. So if we go, if you go to the Object Computing website. Uh, and we'll we'll include this link. Uh, actually, I think this link might actually be in the slides already. Uh, but uh, there's a page dedicated to Micronaut Consulting and commercial support. So if you're using um, uh, Micronaut now, or you'd like to learn more about uh, how your organization might start using Micronaut to realize some of these benefits, uh, please reach out. Uh, there's a number of packages here available that you can review. Uh, you can just request more information, reach right out. So. Um, uh, 
uh, yeah, please just uh, send us a line and um, and uh, and we'll, we'll we'll talk to you about about your needs and and try to find the best way to satisfy them. Uh, when you select OAuth2 as the authentication type, is Micronaut security authentication set to ID token or cookie? Uh, is there a way to set it to bearer? So the the setting that you're referring to is available in your in your application YAML. Um, uh, so you can what, whatever's generated is that's you know kind of a starting point. So if, if you need to move that over to bearer, you can. Um, uh, that said, with OAuth2, uh, that that's not a um, that's not a, a standard thing to do. So a lot of times with OAuth2, you've got a, a, a user and um, you want to actually, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're using a session, uh, a shared session with the user. Do you have anything to add to that, Frederick? Um, yes, basically we set it to ID token. Um, oh, sorry, to yeah. Up. Um, yeah, and, and of course, as it's just a configuration, you can change it, but, um, yeah, we don't provide any configuration for that. Oh, so you have to do that. Okay. Uh, do we have a roadmap for the features? Um, so we have we have the features themselves kind of identified where we want to go next, but we're certainly interested in inputs from the community as far as where they'd like to see uh, mHipster go and grow. Um, uh, timeline, uh, you know, it's it's it, it it's availability and priority and those sorts of things that are going to dictate timeline. List to existing Micronaut tutorials. Absolutely. So I think I'm still sharing my browser here. If you go to Micronaut.io, uh, there's two good places uh, to get some documentation. So you asked about tutorial tutorials specifically. Um, uh, that I would send you to the guides page for, right? So here we have a number of guides about how to use Micronaut with um, uh, different technologies. And we're adding more all the time. Uh, there's a, you know, uh, like just looking at the Micronaut Cache one, we have Java and Grail and Kotlin and Gradle. So depending on your language and your build system, we have uh, variations of the guide available to you. And then there's also the user documentation. So this main user guide link here will take you to uh, this uh, user documentation for Micronaut. And this is kind of, I, I treat it like the handbook, right? So uh, when I'm trying to figure out what a configuration option is for something or how uh, a specific piece of Micronaut works, uh, this is where I start. And we will add those links in there. Uh, will there be a mHipster upgrade path available similar to jHipster upgrade to go from 6.10.5 to 7.01? Um, good, good question. Um, as we didn't start the migration, um, I'm not sure. I don't expect it right now to be necessary because um, usually the upgrade path for the main jHipster is, um, or the jHipster upgrade command is very useful um, because there are many changes, um, especially from six to seven, um, which I don't expect for the Micronaut um, blueprint right now, um, because we are already on um, Micronaut 244, um, and we won't change the, the whole structure a lot, I guess. So um, most possibly you don't need it. Um, and we had to be honest, some some problems with the whole upgrade subgenerator, um, so maybe um, there won't be something like that because it's not required. Hopefully, uh, the generation looks like jHipster's code. Question: Is Micronaut a blueprint uh, so that it is only the class import that is different? How does it work, Frederick? You said you wanted to answer this. Um, yes, um, basically, um, of course, we try to um, generate a similar package structure or similar um, um, yeah, structure like the main jHipster. So you can, um, yeah, you see it's a jHipster application and you don't, uh, you find the same things, the Micronaut equivalent at the same place like the Spring Boot ones. Um, so it's not just the class imports, 
um, that would have not worked. But uh, for some things, um, the templates really look like that, right? So if you think of a, maybe some repository class, um, uh, it's very similar to a Spring data repository just with different imports. Um, but it's a whole, yeah, it's a blueprint. Uh, what is the time frame for .NET Core support? Um, so there's no .NET in Micronaut. Uh, is there a jhipster .NET stuff? Yes, I don't even know. There is, yeah. there is a .NET Core um, generator uh, blueprint. Um, I can. Uh, you find it in on a GitHub jhipster slash jhipster dash .NET Core, and the latest release is four days old. So there you go. Um, you can use it already. Yeah. Uh, this is not a question. It says Micronaut versus Quarkus question mark. That's not a question. Uh, yeah, I'll just skip it for now. Uh, do you support JDL round trip modeling as in JHipster? I'm not sure I get the question. So yeah, I don't understand it either. Um, yeah, if, if you could provide some clarification there. Um, we can maybe answer that for you. I was looking for a domain class that could supply the features provided as in Grails framework in terms of GORM support, uh, the repository aspect. Does GORM for Hibernate and Micronaut support the same feature as in Grails? So you can use GORM uh, with, with Groovy in Micronaut if that's what you're asking. Uh, how easy is it to start with jhipster, then if happy with the initial win, uh, disconnect from it? Uh, Frederick, you want to talk about this? Yes. So um, basically, I will, yeah, for the for the Spring Boot part, um, as you've seen, it's, the code is all yours. Um, there are no, no magic or some hidden libraries. We have a very small um, server-side library, um, which basically just contains some utility classes, right? Um, no special things. So in the end, we are just a, yeah, we're just a pre-configured Micronaut or J -Hips, uh, Spring Boot application. Um, so if you like to disconnect, you can do so. You can remove all the, um, the package JSON files if you like um, and remove the jhipster part. And you can even remove the jhipster um, dependency um, and replace maybe um, these utility classes with your own classes. And, and then you can, are happy. Um, in fact, some of our team members uh, did that. So they have a jhipster application running in production and wanted to um, go ahead with the Spring Boot 2.4 update, um, which took some time on the jhipster core part. So they just disconnected and upgraded um, to Spring Boot 2.4 already. So that's just a thing of um, changing dependencies and you're happy. Yeah, just to add on to that a little bit, um, I know a lot of frameworks have, uh, they're, they're kind of controlling your build and your run and, and that stuff. And so there is there is a need to eject from it if you want to stop stop using it. But uh, with the way that jhipster and mhipster work, what you get is a complete project. So you can really just kind of walk away at any time. Uh, Will jhipster replace Grails? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, uh, Grails is um, a popular, widely used framework. Uh, it solves uh, different needs. Uh, it's it's um, uh, uh, a major uh, open source product of ours, and there's there's zero um, intention to uh, have jhipster replace Grails in any way. Okay, I think we've gone through these. Let me check the chat really quick and see. Uh, all right, a lot of good stuff and thank yous. So you're very welcome and, and thank you. Uh, all right, thanks guys so much. Um, and, and I did type some answers in there, but for those of you who didn't see it, um, we did record this and we'll plan on providing an, um, an email with a recording and the slides. 
and we'll be, we'll send that out in the email and it'll also be available on our site um, sometime next week for on-demand viewing. So thank you guys for your time, Frederick and Jason. We really enjoyed this. And, and like Jason said, we're seeing a lot of that over there in chat. So so thanks again and, and look forward to having you guys back to talk about more about Micronaut and J Hipster and M Hipster and, and all that fun stuff. So thanks again. Thanks. Bye everyone. Us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.